Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I'm going to give you part two of an overview on enteral nutrition and diarrhea. By the end of the video, you should be able to understand why enteral nutrition is often blamed for diarrhea and follow an algorithm to assist in the management of diarrhea. If you find this information useful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. In part one, I defined diarrhea, explained why it's problematic for hospitalized patients, and reviewed the most common etiologies for patients receiving enteral nutrition. This part is going to shift away from those concepts and explore the major reasons enteral nutrition is blamed for diarrhea. In my professional experience, I've seen enteral nutrition get blamed as the cause of diarrhea for the following reasons. 1. Osmolarity 2. The feeding rate 3. Use of a standard formula instead of a pre-digested formula 4. The lactose content of the formula and 5. The fiber content of the formula. We're going to take a look at each of these, starting with osmolarity. Osmolarity was mentioned in part 1 in regard to liquid medications. It's a measure of concentration for solutions, and it's defined by the amount of solute per liter of solution. So, a solution with a high osmolarity is one that has a high concentration of solute per liter. A solution with a high osmolarity can lead to diarrhea because water will always flow from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. It does this to establish equilibrium. If a solution in the small intestine has an osmolarity that's much higher than the tissues that surround it, water will get pulled in and the stool will become loose or watery. Even though osmolarity is a legitimate concern when considering diarrhea, I haven't seen much evidence to support the idea that commercial tube feeding formulas exceed what's tolerated by the vast majority of patients. Formulas usually have an osmolarity that's anywhere from 350 to 800 milliosmoles per liter, which is slightly higher than the approximate 275 to 295 milliosmoles per liter of the blood. Yet the osmolarity of the formula in the container doesn't reflect the osmolarity once it reaches the small intestine. Whether a patient has a gastric or postpyloric feeding tube, formula is diluted by digestive juices, resulting in a significant decrease in osmolarity. For example, using 11 healthy subjects with a nasogastric tube, Miller et al. administered a 400 milliliter bolus of a semi-elemental formula that had an osmolarity of roughly 540 milliosmoles per liter. They found that by the time the chyme reached the ligament of trites, which marks the beginning of the jejunum, the osmolarity was reduced to nearly 300 milliosmoles per liter, just barely above the level of the blood. The authors attributed this to dilution by secretions from various organs along the digestive tract, as well as absorption of some nutrients in the duodenum. Another study, this time by Heketzweiler et al., tested the osmolarity of chyme when formula is infused directly into the jejunum. They provided two different formulas with an osmolarity of about 620 and 500 milliosmoles per liter respectively, at a rate of 120 milliliters per hour over three hours. By the time each one reached the distal jejunum, the osmolarity nearly matched that of the blood. Together, these studies show that the body is equipped to account for the osmolarity of tube feeding formulas by diluting them with digestive juices. There is certainly a limit to the osmolarity that can be handled, but that limit doesn't appear to be exceeded by formula alone. One limitation of these studies is that they included healthy subjects only. As a result, they don't provide insight into the body's ability to dilute when the gastrointestinal tract is impaired. 
a bowel resection or loss of gastric secretions might make it more difficult for this dilution to take place. In that case, a formula that begins with a lower osmolarity may be better tolerated. I'm just not aware of any studies that have tested it. The second reason we're going to explore is the feeding rate. Some clinicians believe that a high feeding rate causes the formula to be poorly absorbed in the small intestine, leading to diarrhea. However, there doesn't appear to be good experimental evidence to support this. Candle et al. set out to determine the maximum feeding rate that a patient can tolerate through a nasoduodenal tube. In this study, the subjects were connected to a mechanical feeding pump, and the researchers increased the rate until adverse effects were observed. They found that the subjects were able to tolerate an average feeding rate of 267 milliliters per hour before they experienced diarrhea. This included an average energy intake of 403% of the estimated need and an average energy load of 99 calories per kilogram per day, which far exceeds what's given to hospitalized patients in practice. This example shows that enteral nutrition can be tolerated at a very high feeding rate, even when it's infused directly into the small intestine. A limitation of this study is that it featured young, healthy subjects with normal digestive function, so it doesn't provide insight into the highest feeding rate tolerated by older subjects or when normal function is impaired. Although there's no data available for those populations, it's reasonable to assume that a feeding rate that provides for just 100% of the estimated energy need shouldn't cause diarrhea. The third reason we're going to explore is standard versus pre-digested formula. The difference between these two types of formula is discussed in my video on that subject, which you can watch here. In short, pre-digested formulas, which includes hydrolyzed and elemental formulas, contain nutrients that are already broken down. The goal here is to make them easier to absorb than standard formulas, where the nutrients are intact. Nevertheless, they haven't been consistently shown to be better tolerated than standard formulas. This isn't just in healthy subjects either. It's also been shown in various disease states like critical illness, acute pancreatitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. This means that switching to pre-digested formula to manage diarrhea is supported more by theory than evidence. Therefore, it shouldn't be considered as an intervention until other etiologies have been ruled out. The fourth reason that enteral nutrition gets blamed for diarrhea is concern for the lactose content of the formula. Many patients and members of the interdisciplinary team believe that tube feeding formulas have milk in them. If this was true, and the patient was lactose intolerant, then diarrhea would make a lot of sense. After reviewing ingredients from the major distributors of tube feeding formula in the United States, Abbott and Nestle, this is clearly not the case. Their products do contain milk byproducts derived from whey and casein protein, but those ingredients would only be an issue if the patient had a milk allergy, not lactose intolerance. In fact, their product labels even say that they are suitable for lactose intolerance. Since the label doesn't go as far as saying lactose-free, I suppose it does leave open the possibility of a trace amount being present. But even if someone is lactose intolerant, a trace amount is unlikely to cause diarrhea. The fifth and final reason that we're going to explore is the fiber content of the formula. Out of all the reasons listed, this one has the most complicated relationship with diarrhea. Patients and members of the interdisciplinary team mostly know fiber as the component of food that adds bulk to the stool and helps us go to the bathroom. When faced with diarrhea, some believe that fiber will increase the chance of a form stool happening, while others believe that it's a contributing factor. 
The research looking at fiber-containing formulas and diarrhea has produced mixed results, with perhaps a slight advantage to fiber assisting in the management of it. This can be mostly attributed to the soluble fiber content, which absorbs water and gelatinizes the stool in the digestive tract. Still, a popular soluble fiber that is used in formula is short-chain fructooligosaccharides, or SCFOS, which is a highly fermentable or FODMAP carbohydrate that can cause or exacerbate gastrointestinal distress. In addition to this, some formulas contain a mix of soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber doesn't absorb water or gelatinize and can sometimes make active gastrointestinal issues worse. Overall, when it comes to fiber and diarrhea, the effect seems to vary from patient to patient. Whereas fiber can cause or worsen diarrhea in one patient, it may improve diarrhea in another. For this reason, it's difficult to draw conclusions about whether it should be avoided or added when diarrhea is present. In the end, it doesn't seem that its presence or absence should be considered as the cause initially, but can be considered once the more likely etiologies are ruled out. When it's considered, fiber should be added or subtracted from the equation, and the patient's stool output and consistency should be monitored closely. Now that we've seen some of the main reasons enteral nutrition is blamed for diarrhea, we can combine them with the information from part 1 to create an algorithm. When a patient who's receiving enteral nutrition develops diarrhea, you'll want to start your assessment of it by looking at the most common etiologies. First, see if there's an underlying gastrointestinal disease or medical condition that may be causing it. Is the patient receiving medical management for it? If they're not, that needs to be addressed. If diarrhea persists with medical management of the disease, or if there is no disease present, then fecal impaction should be considered next. When was the last bowel movement before diarrhea? Is there a history of constipation or a condition that increases risk? Abdominal imaging for fecal impaction can be pursued if it's suspected. If there's no fecal impaction, then the medications list should be evaluated. Change liquid medications to the tablet form. Discontinue any laxatives or stool softeners and see if the patient is receiving antibiotics. If none of these are applicable, or if the diarrhea persists after the changes are made, check for any possible sources of infection, including C. diff. If there's no infection, each of the measures has been taken, and the diarrhea persists, then the formula can be changed. I would start by looking at the fiber content of the formula that's being used. If the formula is fiber containing, switch the patient to a formula that is fiber free. If the formula is already fiber free, consider trying one that has soluble fiber in it or add a soluble fiber supplement like psyllium husk. Beyond fiber, there's not a whole lot of promise in making further changes. It's at this point that you could switch from a standard formula to a pre-digested formula, reduce the feeding rate while maintaining the energy load, or trial a plant-based hypoallergenic formula like Kate Farms or Complete. Here is a summary for this lesson. In my professional experience, I've seen enteral nutrition get blamed as the cause of diarrhea for the following reasons osmolarity, the feeding rate, use of a standard formula instead of a pre-digested formula, the lactose content of the formula, and the fiber content of the formula. With most of these, the theoretical concern makes sense, but in practice, they don't exactly hold up. The available evidence suggests that the body is equipped to account for the osmolarity of tube feeding formulas by diluting them with digestive juices. 
It also suggests that enteral nutrition can be tolerated at a very high feeding rate, even when it's infused directly into the small intestine, that hydrolyzed and elemental formulas are not consistently tolerated better than standard formulas, and that most formulas contain milk byproducts only and are suitable for lactose intolerance. The area where the research is not so clear is the fiber content of formula. On the one hand, soluble fiber gelatinizes the stool and appears to be helpful in the management of diarrhea. On the other hand, some soluble fiber ingredients are FODMAPs that can lead to gastrointestinal distress, and some fiber-containing formulas have insoluble fiber, which is known to exacerbate gastrointestinal distress. Given this information, the following steps should be taken when a patient on enteral nutrition develops diarrhea. First, see if there's an underlying gastrointestinal disease that may be causing it. Second, consider the possibility of fecal impaction. Third, review the medications list and adjust liquid medications, laxatives, stool softeners, or antibiotics. And fourth, check for any possible sources of infection, including C. diff. If there's no infection, each of these measures have been taken, and the diarrhea persists, then the formula can be changed. Here, the first place to look is the fiber content of the formula. If the formula is fiber-containing, switch the patient to a formula that is fiber-free. If the formula is already fiber-free, try one that has soluble fiber in it, or add a soluble fiber supplement to it. If all of these efforts fail, you can switch from a standard formula to a pre-digested formula, reduce the feeding rate while maintaining the energy load, or trial a plant-based hypoallergenic formula. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.